Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show today. I have a very special guest, a mentor of mine, the head coach over at Enlifted, Enlifted.me. His name is Mark England. Mark, how are you tonight? Matt, what's going on, buddy? What's uh, cooking? Great, uh, great to see you. I'm just, I'm happy to have you on and just good to, great to catch up. And um, I'm excited uh, for this conversation on language that we're going to have today. So thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Good to see you as well, man. Awesome. So yeah, so a little bit about us, uh, the, you know, how we got to the, the how we got to meet story. Um, so I remember, I still remember, this is a big part of my, my origin story, just in, in what I'm doing now. Uh, I was hopping on that first call with you and, uh, you know, and just being super intrigued by everything that you're saying. And, and as I mentioned before we got started, I still have my soft talk keywords uh, posted up here in my office from July or sorry, June 30th, 2021. And then got into level one and lifted, I think, mid July of last year, and then did level two after that. So uh, it's been a big part of my transformation. And, and uh, it's, it's the anchor of my coaching and everything. So I was I just super honored that you come on to to the show and, and talk about uh, your experience with lifted and with language and everything uh, to do with that. So um, yeah, dude, right, right away, I just want to get into it. Um, what drew you into the language game? Because I know uh, initially, if you can even go back in time to when you were into, um, you know, into MMA and everything. And you, so you went from this like sport, essentially, and then you, you really got into like the mental side of things and the language. So what, what uh, how did you find yourself on that path? It was a, it was a gap, a no man's land, a year long swath <laughs> of pain and misery between the ending of, um, yeah, it sounds better than it was my fight career and me going to that first workshop on emotional detoxification. And that period of time, um, there was no laughing. I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. And I very likely negation didn't smile in a, in an authentic way. I was just the, the, I, so I thought I was a tough guy, everybody. And I got into, I wrestled in high school and got into MMA and I was fighting and I loved the attention and thought that me doing that, getting in the ring, it, it, and it, I, 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 I thought that I had dealt with my, demons so to speak by doing that and when that um story that process the 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 training stopped on a dime i i got my knee jacked up for the second time the thing just stopped and uh when that stopped everything that i thought i had dealt with came up again plus worse and i entrenched a world-class third degree black belt level victim mentality. And I used that fail as the final, because there had been years of uh, me accumulating evidence, using that fail as a final piece of evidence in the case I was secretly making against myself in my head, that there was something wrong with me, I was doomed to fail. It was never going to work out. Why'd you even try, bro? And that story was so strong and loud. I, I, I robbed myself of the ability to enjoy my life. And one of those things was smiling and laughing. And after a year of that, thank God, I had the awareness to look down that path and take a, you know, meet 50. I'm, I'm turning 46 on Friday. And you know, I looked, I looked down that path. I said, dude, are you going to be complaining about this when you're 55? Are you going to be the guy that talks about the thing that never could have, you could have, would have been that, the, that person. And I said, if you do that one, that's, that's a very ugly picture. And two, then you really will be a loser. So uh, I said, I'll take anything but that. And I meant it. I was living in Thailand at the time and went down to a, uh, a cleansing resort. My, my vice principal came back from this cleansing resort down on an island in the Gulf of Thailand called the Spa. And he said, they're doing some really cool stuff down there. It's kind of weird. And 
but I like it. I feel better. I actually asked some questions and he gave me the website. And it was this whole pay to not eat for a week. You go down there, it's a great gig. You pay them to not eat. <laughs> they do give you some herbal detox pills and you get some yoga classes and a punch card to the steam room. And um, it's a cleanse, everybody. And I went down there and I did it and I came back feeling better. I said, I'm going back. My third trip down there, I went to an emotional detoxification workshop. And guess what? This is in 2003. The guy was talking about words and stories and breathing and then he asked if there was anyone that uh, was was stuck on a story this woman shot her hand up and told a, a legitimate bad borderline nasty breakup humiliating there's the right word humiliating breakup story and he had her tell the story a few times and he got down to the, the sentence the sentence that really resonated with me and that sentence was he did that to me he did that to me and i had a very similar story that guy shouldn't have kicked me that hard we were just warming up and so he had her take that last word me out of the sentence and put in himself and her whole story got flipped on its head and i watched it and so did 25 other people and not not only did the story get flipped on its head but her face her breath unlocked and something in me goes that 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 and so the story went it, it went from he did that to me to he did that to himself she's like he did that to himself she was she was having a conversation with herself about the this potential new story and <sighs> He did. You see the breath unlock. He did do that. And you see her talk herself into a new interpretation of the event. He did do that to himself. And then she started talking about all the people that were mad at him and all the stuff that like, because it was some fallout, nuclear fallout. He hooked up with her best friend in front of everybody one night and dumped her in front of everybody the next night down at Beachwood. Come on, ouch. And, um, and then she goes, you know, fine. And then she got to the end, which was, that was never going to work out anyway. That guy was actually really weird just walked her right out of this victim villain thing. And I said, that's not my story, but that's my story. And I've been, I've been in the game since. That's amazing. I love it. Set the table for so much, so much that we can talk about here. I want to start with the victim mentality. That was actually at the top of the list, Mark. So it's yeah. great that you already, uh, you already mentioned that. And, you know, so for me, my personal experience, uh, you know, in, in early sobriety, part of my process was, that there was a degree of blame there's shame within me and as a result i started blaming other things around me other people around me so i had a degree of that victim mentality and i have a feeling i imagine there's going to be a lot of people that can relate to that now of course i i with time i as i started doing the, my own inner work i started pointing the finger back at myself and you know we'll get into that but the victim mentality and if somebody that is you know that's resonating with them right now they're here they're listening to that and you know, somewhere deep inside, there's that small voice that's saying that, yeah, that that's me, but you aren't quite ready to, to, to get there or that yet. What is like, where are some of the, uh, you know, just what else can we say about the victim mentality about getting that energy moving? And what would you say to somebody that's listening to that going, mm, that could be me, but eh, not quite there yet. How about we start with this? So, uh, I'm about to recite and I'll do it twice for emphasis, the verbatim definition of the victim mentality. And you all hearing this puts you in a very exclusive club of people because most people have never heard it. They've never heard the definition of the victim mentality, especially in the way that Matt and I are going to break down the definition because the definition is interesting in and of itself. And then there's the components of it. There's the sophistication of the conversation around it. And what this is not before we get into it, is victim blaming. That's not what this is. This is victim mentality explaining. Those are two different things. People talk a lot about hate speech. Okay, okay, fine. I get, I get it. And let's go after the self-hate speech. What do you think is more uh, common of an occurrence? Hate speech or self-hate speech? Okay. Because I know... The, the amount of trash talk 
that has gone on in my head pointed at me is nothing compared it's minus it's homeopathic there's nothing compared to the amount of quote unquote negativity or hate speech that come out of my mouth they're not even like who said more tr- who's talked more trash to me than me i mean honestly it's not even a, not even a discussion so the definition of the victim mentality i'm going to say it m- medium paced first time and then i'm going to speed it up the second time the victim mentality is an acquired personality trait where a person tends to regard himself or herself as the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence. The victim mentality depends on a habitual thought process and attributions. Second time, the victim mentality is an acquired personality trait where a person tends, it's a tendency. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. They tend to regard themselves as the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence. The victim mentality depends as it has, as in it has to have folks, a habitual thought process and attributions. Habitual accurately implies duration and addiction and thought process. So if there's a thought process, also known as thinking and, and uh, repetitive sentences, repetitive thoughts that the victim mentality has to have in order to be set and sustained, then what are the thoughts? What are the thoughts and what words go in there? Because guess what? There's only a finite, finite amount of ways that I can piss myself off with my language. And that's what we study. We study the art and science of how people use their words, or, or should I say their language uses them it, their their words work against them because most people's language is working against them unbeknownst to them and this is an education issue this has nothing to do with intelligence or deservance i have a degree in education i could take a dump on the the education system on a whole so coming up in the public school system on neither side of that street and getting a degree in education did I have one course class or conversation about how to use my language? And when I say language, I mean internal dialogue and external dialogue, what we think, what we say, what we write. Let's keep it easy, it's simple. How to use my language to stay focused on what's important to me, keep the drama low, build up the good, confident vibes, and make at least dis- decent pictures of myself in my own mind. Quite the opposite. Spelling, regular spelling, grammar, and definitions. And most people can nod their head to that. Yeah. You know, and one thing that comes to mind when I think of victim mentality, and, and it's important to mention too, is it's you, you, you broke it down as you gave the definition. But if somebody's listening to this and going, well, I did have some wrong done to me. Yep. And it is, as we're mentioning, there is the room for isolated incidents. It's when you take that wrongdoing and continue to apply it and as a filter to everything else that happens in your life and and you're looking for evidence you mentioned evidence in your origin story as well you start looking for evidence to keep you in that sort of stuck you know uh victimized mindset essentially right yeah for sure you know some a, 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 a handful maybe even one unfortunate scenario transpires and uh someone could create the story is I can't trust anyone. And then I go out into my adult life while part of me craves connection and attention and um, love and positive relationships. But I've got this, uh, this idea, this, this emotionally charged idea. It's a belief system, which is a fancy word for an idea, which is a fancy word for an opinion. You're not going to find you can't trust anyone on the periodic table of elements. These stuff, this stuff isn't facts, folks. It's not like, um, you know, uh, uh, it's a, they aren't units of measurement. Okay, how long is that plank of wood? It's a you know, six. Uh, don't it, why even tries? It's 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 their ideas, and so we go into our life again, craving these very normal and healthy human experiences and experiences with other people you got that voice in the back of your head whispering sometimes yelling you can't trust anyone don't let your guard down you can't trust anyone don't let your guard down nothing ever works for you why even try you're a total joke nobody listens to you and it's and because it's not like you hear one negative sentence and then you're done for the day it's this it's this thing that just i mean 
just relentless. Can we say that it's relentless until it's checked and the volume is turned down on it? Because you can do that. And um, and yes, guess what? Newsflash. We cannot change the past. And we can definitely change our interpretation of what happened. Okay, there's a big difference there. There's a very big difference there. And we can also change uh, part of the changing of that interpretation goes from, if I think about and visualize and emotionalize about uh, about the, the thing that happened to me 20 years ago, and every time it's 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 real, I'm in the picture, it's subjective, it's still personal, okay? We can go from 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 that, which is not fun, okay, to being the observer of what happened, and then getting that distance, getting that breathing room. Uh, uh, going from the participant to the observer, subjective to objective, and in that process, our our interpretation. Because it's not the story; it's not the thing that gets us, folks. It's not the thing that gets us. It's the meaning that we assign to the thing. It's what it means about us, and that is always up for review. If you know mm. what you're doing. So good. Let's get into that. I love I love that quote, man. I, I I've always very much enjoyed that one. You know, it's not the, the thing that gets you. It's your story about the thing. Yeah, I wrote that down and underlined it three times, right? As, you know, as you mentioned in, in our classes. So uh, but let's get into it. How can we reinterpret? How can we re reframe? I want to start with coming out of victim mentality, just speaking from my own personal experience. There was, and you'd mentioned with the, that voice, that relentless voice going and going and going. And it's a lot of, um, for me, it was a lot of the binary. Like, I'm always like this. I will never get this. And it's this overly dramatic I, I believe it's for me, it was like cried to, uh, uh, you know, centered by like, it's a cry for help or, or uh, desperation that in an attempt to change my behavior with this overly dramatic speech. So like binary. And I also want to get into, cause victim mentality for myself was a lot of projecting a lot of, I did not want to deal with some of these. I didn't know how to deal with some of these emotions that were coming up in me. So I was putting it on somebody else and pointing an accusatory finger at them saying that it's 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 them that's doing it and to me that just went so hand in hand with my personal experience with victim mentality so binary and the projections i would love i would love it if you could uh, shed some light on that please sure that second sentence of the victim mentality the, the victim mentality depends on a habitual thought process habitual like i said duration and addiction and people can and very frequently do get addicted to drama Okay. We get, we get addicted to our emotional status, our emotional patterning. Okay. Whatever we get used to, we can get addicted to feeling fantastic. You can get addicted to feeling horrible and um, binary language turns up the, the, the drama and people can get used to that. And it's, it's, it's also fun. I'm going to break it down further in a second. It's also fun to totally absolve yourself from responsibility of things, which mm. it's called halo horns effect, which means I'm going to make them the exclusive uh, demon, which absolves me from any interaction and all wrongdoing. So I'm, I'm, I am, I am exclusively right. So what does that sound like? Um, she, always makes me feel like I'm not good enough. That right there is a tasty little morsel of a pain, <laughs> pain and chaos on the way. Cause that's bad enough if I think it and believe it. Oh, if that comes out of my mouth. Oh, if that comes out of my mouth in the kitchen, 10 minutes after I walk in the door. You always make me feel like I'm not good enough. Let's break that down, folks. So we're now, and this is not woo, okay, even though woo's fun. Webster's, Webster's definition of a spell, not mine, a word or a combination of words of great influence. That's it, okay? And they work for better and they work for worse, okay? Spells, sentences, statements, ideas, opinions, belief systems, choose your words. And uh, so, so the fastest way that I know of to break a spell is to write the thing down. What an interesting thing to do. What an interesting thing to do is to write down 
the words I hear in my head and stare at them as opposed to knee jerk reaction, believe them. I mean, of course it's true. It's my own voice in my own head. Let's just, let's go with the first thing that shows up. It's not even a draft because you got to, if it's, it, it, it's got to be written down to be a draft. I don't even have a draft to hand in. I'm just going with the roughest of drafts. There is my thoughts. What could possibly go wrong? Pick up the pen, write, write down the statement. You always make me feel like I'm not good enough. Once pen, once words hit paper, folks, now the ball is majorly back in your court to a legitimate degree. And then because you, you, you work with Matt, you know, you know about binary language, always and never. Those are the two main binary, because it's exclusive. It's always or it's never. Okay. Always. Does she always make me feel insecure? Do you always, does it, uh, well, well, I mean, not always. Okay. Sometimes. Yeah, fine. Sometimes you start to take these pacifiers out of your mouth <sighs> and the breath unlocks. Uh, she, you sometimes make me feel insecure. Okay. The thermometer is coming down. And if I really want to play the game, you know, who does that more than me? Yeah, there's that first word. There's that projection keyword, you. Mark, I lost. There we go. Are we good? We're good. It dropped out for some reason. Apologies. All good. Where did I, where did I, where, where did it drop? Uh, you were, you were just meant, you met, just mentioned projection. Got it. There's the projection keyword. And if, because you work with Matt, you know this, you, you sometimes make me feel like I'm not good enough. And since I'm here to play the game all the way through, okay, fine. I, I mean, part of me doesn't want to do it and I'm going to do it. I'm going to take out that you and put in I. I sometimes make me feel like I'm not good enough. Ouch. And within the ouch is also this, thank God, I'm taking control of this out of control story. I'm taking responsibility for it. There's some, it is way beyond my pay grade. And there's, we have some built in, and you can definitely speak to this. We have some built in positive feedback system in us that we get uh, rewarded. There's the word rewarded for taking our story and going like this. Mm. Did you experience that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm seeing some beautiful instances of it when people are ready. And when I was ready, man, it was a lot more relieving than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about breath unlocking and such, because initially it's, and that's, that's the thing is if you're, if you're not quite ready to hear that, and I believe you, you use the term, it, it gets you right on the nose. And if you're not used, if you're not used to it, or if you haven't been through that experience, whoo. And, you know, so there was an initial stage where at times I would, I would get a little bit defensive and then it would just be, it was such a quick way through the defenses and I would just, okay, I got it. I got it. So absolutely. It's, it's, it's incredibly powerful. To be expected. Very normal. Some stories are easier to let go of than others. Okay. Because it's not just the sentence. It's, it's, it's everything that comes after that too. Because if, if I take responsibility for that, then I got to take responsibility for those 19 other things. And that's a lot. And you know what? It is. There's no free lunches here, folks. Okay? This work is tough. There are times when it feels like you're burn, that your insides are burning up when you go from to this. And, and guess what? I'll take, I'll take a little bit of sting or even a lot of sting right now than, than you know, carrying around this stuff for 30, 40 years, just a handful of decades. 
you know that's 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 the that's the real scary thing that's that's that that if you take the time invest the time you're not taking or spending if you invest the time um, uh, if you get a good look at it it'll terrify you to your core living with these stories in the back of my head sometimes in the front, front burner for you know three four decades more you know two more decades three just just 20 years you know in comp- <laughs> that should pucker you up quite quick um and yeah, sometimes it, it takes a little while to get your head around this stuff. This woman came in, sat down, started telling me the story of her divorce, lackluster marriage and divorce a while ago, just years ago. And her, her sentence was, he made me think we needed to get married. Look at the words, everybody. He made me think we needed to get married. And so because he made me think we needed to get married, all the drama that happened in the marriage takes two to tango was on him. And I had her repeat it. And then I said, take out the he and put in I. And she goes like this. And just stared at me. And I stared at her. Something's going to happen. And and I and she didn't say anything. I said, okay. Who thinks your thoughts? Part of her said it, a good part of her didn't want to. Me, because you could hear how she said it. Me. Who feels your feelings? Who creates your feelings? You or him? <sighs> she's pissed because she's now she's in this checkmate. Uh me. Cool. Just try it out. See, see try it out. I made me think we needed to get married. And then she goes into the story about how she was feeling a lot of pressure from her family and all this stuff. And then eventually the thing started unraveling. You got to think linchpin, everybody, like a, like a boat on a trailer. And you got that linchpin in there. And that thing is not getting put in the water to go water skiing with your friends um, and have a good time. With the music, like in the, you get the suntan. No, that thing's on the, on the trailer and it's not coming out. And there are, there are linchpin sentences. And, and then also, so look at the words again. He made me think we needed to get married, or he did that to me, or you always make me feel like I'm insecure. Those are all projections, and they're all going to force me to make the victim-villain mental imagery. He did that to me. I'm in the picture. He's in the picture. I'm on the receiving end of something. I have to wait till they change their behavior so I can feel good about myself. Uh, Please hurry up. And yeah, that um, not the best strategy, really not the best strategy. It's painful. It's a very painful world to uh, chronically reside in. And the good news is, is that this stuff is not rocket science. Okay. Pick up a pen, write down your most, write down some, (laughs) write down some words with soft talk in it. Why don't we just make this easy on people? Okay. Cause guess what? Soft talk is no pun intended, the gateway drug to the rest of your language. Cause it's an easy place to start. It's a very easy place to start where I just start taking out um, a handful of, of keywords and which we can we'll, we'll we'll go over here in a second, uh, and as the the as the old great saying goes, "She who feels it knows it," or "He who feels it knows it." You know, um, maybe I would get better results if I was more consistent. Let's just go there. You know, let's 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 come off this super high cliff of projections, and because the projections, that's where the venom resides, folks. That's where generally speaking people have their strongest emotional reactions when their stories and their words and the stronger the emotional reaction the greater the attachment okay so let's just turn the volume down on it and make it (laughs) fun-ish and (laughs) and taking out soft talk cam plucky in the nose never felt that (laughs) oh absolutely oh do tell matt and then we'll do a little soft talk magic 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, when we started doing uh, getting into like goal setting, I noticed, and you know what, it's it's different from when I'm because we talk a lot about inner dialogue in, in the the work that I'm doing. Uh, I found that I was using it when I would, and it was a confidence thing when I would say uh, a goal out loud to somebody. I would always put in I, always, I would always put a maybe in there or something along those lines, just so I wouldn't there wouldn't be any follow up like, oh yeah, so when are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? Right. I would just, I would purposely slide some soft talk in there so there wouldn't be any follow up questions. And then when you had pointed out or it had been pointed out and then lifted at some point, you know, uh, soft talk goal setting specifically and the difference of the energy that it has. Uh, man, that, that was a big game changer for me. So realizing that I had been essentially sabotaging myself in it, you know, in, in a, in a effort to soften or, you know, to temper my assertiveness, or if I have this like big, uh, in my opinion, or what it may be perceived as this big audacious goal, I'm going to like, oh, slide a little maybe in there. And maybe, maybe somebody won't ask me a follow-up question. Right. And then it'll be out there, but it'll be kind of out there. It won't be fully out there. So yeah, that, that was a, that was a big challenge for me. Yeah. It pushes, it pushes very specific buttons. Um, so the keywords let's just let's there, there we go may i i i guess i might be drinking too much coffee <laughs> Listen, i guess i might be drinking too much coffee take out the guess i might be drinking too much coffee take out the might damn it I'm drinking too much coffee. Most of the time when people use soft talk about stuff they are doing, um, uh, 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 it, it, it's when, when the words get solid, it forces an issue and therein mm -hmm. lies some of the resistance. Now I have no wiggle room. Okay. Now I've called it out for what it is. You know, I think I should spend more time with my wife. Okay, I can say that and head straight to the bar there right after work. No problem. Well, even though there's problems, <laughs> um, I give myself an out. You know, it's almost like I'm procrastinating. That's funny. Uh, no, take out the think. I, I, I should spend more time with the wife. Take out the should, put in can. I can. I can spend more time with my wife. Okay. Well, what is more time? Um, what, we have that third weekend in July. I mean, we could go. Uh, and then you. So you talk yourself into taking action. There's an art and a science to talking yourself out of stuff, and soft talk leads the charge. Okay. There's an art and a science to talking yourself into things, and solid talk leads the charge. And essentially, it's just it's taking out these handful of of keywords. No. It's not like I'm procrastinating. I am procrastinating. Okay. It's not, it's, I, I don't think I'm drinking too much. I know I'm drinking too much coffee. I, I, I should probably return their phone call. No, I, I am returning their phone call at nine 30 and I just wrote it down and now it's like very likely going to happen way more likely than if I keep thinking and shooting and maybe should I give them the soft talk keywords, Matt? Please do. Yeah. Okay, great. Should we talk about reticular activating system, Matt? Let's get into it. I love reticular activating system. Absolutely. And there's a lot of action here. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to tell some stories. Is that okay if I tell some stories about Please. the next five, six minutes, and then we'll yeah. hit the soft talk keywords. And because they got the, 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 we front loaded it with the reticular activating system, it'll make it even more valuable to them when they hear it. Okay, cool. Here's a tale of two stories. Well, three, actually, my car got stolen once upon a time. And, uh, when I realized what had happened, I called my father. This is in Richmond. And Brown and Browner, I'm at the farm. Brown and Browner is right out there. Dude. It's right out there. Oh, yeah. Still That's there. Amazing. Wicked. And uh, I called my dad and I said, Dad, somebody stole my car. I've got stuff to do. I need to come get the farm truck. So I drove out to my father's farm and picked up one of his prized possessions, which is a 1985-ish ford f-150 two tones of brown we call it brown and browner he bought it brand new off the showroom floor it's still in mint condition right over there and um 
I drove Brown and Browner into Richmond. And within 24 hours, I started seeing 1985-ish Ford F-150s all over the place. Most people have had that experience. Have you had that experience, Matt? Oh, heck yeah. As soon as I got a 2016 Tiguan, that's like all I saw on the road. It was, I'm like, man, everybody's got them now. Like, yeah, but where before it was, you know, maybe a handful, but um, it was literally like every intersection I'd see a 2016 Tiguan. Where are these things coming from? I'm driving a Wrangler. I got a Wrangler and everybody waves. The rank, the Jeep people wave to the Jeep people. Uh, uh, nobody else knows that except the Jeep people, right? And like I said, most people have had that experience. Uh, they buy a new car. They start to see that new car out and about. This has been very well studied, folks. Uh, and, and one of the most popular and easy, e relatable social psychological social psychology studies, Invisible Gorilla. Look it up. Two social psychologists. You can still see the original video on YouTube. Created a one-minute video in 1999. They took seven college students, dressed three up in white three up in black, gave the white team a couple of basketballs, gave the black team a couple of basketballs, and then filmed them passing the balls back and forth to each other for one minute. 30 seconds in, the seventh college student dressed up in a gorilla costume walks into the middle of all of that, turns and looks at the camera, beats his chest and walks out, and then they show that one minute video to tens of thousands of people, and they ask them they, they, well, they direct their attention. They said, count how many times the basket, the, the white team passes the basketball back and forth to the white team. Spoiler alert, correct answer is 15. And then afterwards, they ask them, well, what was the number? Some people got it. Some people didn't. Oh, by the way, did you happen to see that gorilla? 50%, five, zero, 50 percent of the population edit out something so seemingly obvious as a gorilla, a student dressed in a gorilla costume because they simply were not looking for it. The reticular activating system has a search and edit function. So once something gets programmed as important, also known as whatever you emotionalize over, once it gets programmed as important, the reticular activating system goes on a search and edit function. I'm going to go find more of this, more of these trucks, okay, uh, more of the, the uh, and I'm going to edit out anything that's not what I'm looking for. So if it's not the white team passing the basketballs back and forth to each other, uh, as in a gorilla in this case, I'm going to edit it out completely. I'm, I'm negation. I'm not going to see it. Literally, physically, actually not going to see it. I'm going to look. It's just not going to appear on my screen. Now, the question is, does the reticular activating system only work for 1985 Ford F-150s and 2016 Tiguans and students in gorilla costumes, or is our language influencing uh, our reticular activating system? Here's the tale of two stories. Can I drop an F-bomb? Do it. Cool, because it makes the story better, and it's, it's, what, it's what happened. And then we're going to do we're going to do the soft talk keywords, okay? And then we'll go wherever else. We want to in the in the so um, uh, uh, this this woman comes in, sits down, was so I've been coach I've been coaching for fifteen years. Everybody, I'm the head coach of Enlifted, uh, one of the co-founders of Enlifted, and I've been researching, presenting, and coaching on the power of words and stories and identity somewhere between full time and overtime the whole time for the past fifteen years. Okay, I live this stuff, and uh, uh, a lot of that comes from doing a, a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. This woman comes in, sits down, and she was very forthcoming. She said, I'm having a problem in my marriage. My husband thinks I'm attractive, and I refuse to believe him. I know when it got started, and I just don't know what to do about it. And I said, oh, tell me more. She's 10 years old. She goes to uh, her grandma's house for Christmas. And as soon as they walk in the back door, her aunt's standing there and leans down and goes, my, you have a big nose, just like me. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> Little girl tightens up, runs into uh, uh, the bathroom. And Matt, I know you've heard this story before. And what do you think the first thing she looked at was when she got into the mirror? 
She's looking at that nose. Looking at that nose, which is, of course, no bigger now physically than it was five seconds ago. But in her imagination, she's got a honker, which means what? She's ugly. And then the reticular activating system goes, uh, oh, you're ugly? Great. I'm going to go find all the other flaws and, and, and edit out anything that's redeeming. Okay, so when your husband goes to compliment you, damn, baby, you look good tonight. You don't really mean that. Think that's going to cause some problems? That's going to cause some problems. And so that is a that is an ex- tale of two stories because there can be there are spells. Remember the definition: a word or a combination of words of great influence. There are constrictive spells, combinations of words that create that stress response, the tightness and rigidity in the body, that quote unquote dense, heavy energy, trap the breath in the chest, force us to stare at something repeatedly over and over again. Um, and then there are expansive spells, okay, words that, that make us uh, that feel bigger and take breaths of fresh air and um, create the good feels and make ourselves uh, the spaciousness in our imagination. And, and so that's obviously an example of a constrictive spell. 2014, I'm giving a presentation at uh, a festival and this guy's setting up a booth right next to where we were presenting. And he comes up afterwards and he says, man, that was really cool. Uh, loved all of it. You want to hear a great story? And I'm like, of course. And he said his grandpa took him out in the backyard when he was like 12 or 13. And he said, little Johnny, life's wild. There's going to be ups and downs, twists and turns, and zigs and zags. And you're going to get some things right. And you're going to get some things wrong. Just always remember to err on the side of being a badass motherfucker. And he, <laughs> grandpa dropped an F-bomb on And he said, in that moment, I saw myself as capable and confident, and I felt like I got my my energy grew. And he said, man, I've made a lot of mistakes. And you know what? I get things right. And guess what? I go after what I want. Oh, and by the way, I like being me. And he said that, and I'm like, that's, there it is right there. Better spells, folks. Any spell can be broken. Okay. Any spell can be broken and it starts with the words and it really starts when the words hit paper. So get a pen. Are they, are they doing this? Uh, we do have it. This is actually part of the, uh, part of the course. So you're doing the intro okay, to the, uh, yeah, it's absolutely part of the course. You got her. Okay. Super cool. Uh, you all know what to do or let's do this again. These key words, folks, write them down. Um, or if you've already written them down, listen to them again. Here are the soft talk keywords. And here's my soft talk keyword promise. If you, and it takes most people three to six months, if you cut your soft talk usage in half, you will double your confidence. And you with double the confidence is a, the world will go from flat to round. Okay, and if you're a flat earther, it'll go from round to flat. But that's another, either here nor there. Uh, so, he, write these words. There's only a handful of them. Okay, maybe, might, think, guess, sort of, kind of, almost like, probably. Perhaps, try, hopefully, and one day. You want to be a two-day person more than a one-day person, folks. Because like I said, there's an art and a science to talking yourself into stuff. And one of the things that you want to talk yourself into is, um, this might sound Stuart Smalley-ish, is to liking yourself more. Because you can and it's way easier to uh, like yourself more when you feel better in your skin. And it's way easier to feel better in your skin when you're breathing well. Mm. As in you've unlocked your – most people's breathing mechanics are wrecked. They're absolutely wrecked. And a large part of that 
is due to the ongoing trash talk story that's happening in their head on a daily basis and the the unresolved stories from their past that they're hoarding they have not written down and out which we can absolutely talk about that um, did you know that the second and third, I forget which one's which, doesn't matter. Second and third most commonly purchased over-the-counter medication, medications in the United States are indigestion medication and constipation medication. I did not know that. Yeah. And you know what? My personal and professional opinion, Mr. Simple over here, take it or leave it. It's because the breath is trapped in the chest. When people are breathing poorly, things work poorly. OK, and if we want to get back, which we do to the definition of the victim mentality, that second sentence, the definition, the, the victim mentality depends on a habitual thought process and attributions. What does that mean? That that's characteristics. OK, it is super easy to see yourself as a victim of fill in the blank, plural plus blanks when your breath is trapped in your chest most of the time. OK, it's hard to see yourself as a victim of fill in the circumstances when you're breathing low and slow. Most of the time we are designed physiologically to to operate well, which includes digesting our food and pooping when we're breathing low and slow, when our breath is when we're in parasympathetic nervous system response, folks. And most people are walking around in sympathetic nervous system response or stress response or fight or flight response. Hoarding stories. Did I say that? Yeah, hoarding stories. Mark, I want to take a second just to do a recap. I love getting into the breathing. I have a little a story about that. And now, you know, credit to you on this one. Before I do, like, you know, we were, I love all the stuff that we're talking about. So just retracing, you know, my footsteps in my journey. You know, the opposite of a projection is what? It's a reflection. So when we're talking about, and I'm, I encourage everybody that goes through my program, and it was a big part for me. Reflections for me was getting pen to paper. And it's very much like just uh, doubling down on what you're seeing as far as getting what is going through my head, putting it down on paper, reading it back, and often going, whoa, is that, am I actually feeling that way? There's a, there's a uh, you know, a, a, an ability to, be a little more objective, you know, take out a little bit more, you know, just look, look at it, read it, feel it, you know, and capture it instead of having this cycle of this over and over again, you know, so the, I wanted to mention that and how important journaling is. I'm glad, glad you brought that up. And yeah, the soft, the soft talk thing, just to one, one, uh, part, you know, follow up um, on that as well as I, I definitely found in my leadership, in my, uh, my management career, I would use soft talk just because I remember, I remembered certain management styles and managers that were just so over the top assertive and using fear-based management. So as a result, I, I, I didn't want to be that negation acknowledge. I didn't want to be like that. So what I would do was I would again, temper my message to the people that I was managing with soft talk under the idea that I was uh, more approachable or that I was, you know, uh, basically tempering my assertiveness to them. Realizing now, looking back, that there was a degree of gray area or ambiguity that was created by me doing this. And so that one is per in particular has been quite challenging for me to, uh, to get out of. Uh, but I love what you, how you broke it down, the soft talk, plucking out, we got the keywords going on. That's awesome. And just again, with the breath, one final thought and breath, is um, the first time I had you on my show, and this is probably about a year ago, almost to the day, I would imagine, uh, was you had mentioned, okay, how is your breathing? And I was about to turn 40 at the time, and no one had ever asked me that. I had never asked myself that. So it was, it was a big game changer for me to actually start getting aware of my breath, and I did. And so the, this past year, I've been very much focusing on, okay, where is my breath? And it's in moments of stress that I'll do it because when I do the fight flight, I do the other one, I do the freeze. So if I'm reaching a, a state of, um, you know, anxiety or, or stress, or there's a few things going on and I got to focus, I stop breathing, you know, so that, or I should say that was the old me. I, I'm getting a lot better and more practiced at catching myself doing that going, okay, hold on a second. I'm going to pause now. Feels so good. I'm getting a lot more connected with it. 
Um, but yeah, and again, that's one of these things I really wish there had been a, a focus on it, uh, you know, beforehand, before I'd gotten to the, the stage that I was when I, when I recognized it. But yeah, breathing is just so incredibly important, isn't it? It is. Um, well, I mean, in, in historically, in numerous spiritual traditions, they equate breath with spirit inspired inspiration the um going back to what you said about and we'll we'll touch more on breathing here in a second reflection <laughs> side note you're a musician did you know that the Wu-Tang Clan's lyrics are more sophisticated by an order of magnitude than Shakespeare? No, I, I did not know that. Negation of God. Some, somebody created a scale of sophistication of, Interesting. Of, of the English language, lyrics, in poem and song. And the Wu-Tang Clan the sophistication of their lyrics is almost at the very top. It's almost unmatched. I mean, they smoke wow. Shakespeare. And um, I, on Joe Rogan, the RZA was talking about who's the head of the Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, didn't think we were talking about the Wu-Tang Clan on here, did you folks? Right. He said that he quoted the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, which is nice. the, the, um, the Bible of Hinduism. And he said reflection the gita states reflection will take you further than prayer Ooh, wow. self-reflection will take you further than prayer and the kind of reflection that we're talking about is yes there are direct reflections where you know i take out the you and put in i and then just a reflection in general upon my language okay and what will happen i i, I expect you to not believe me everyone i expect you to not believe me and if you change some seemingly minor everyday ordinary language and we're not even talking about the heaviest lifting which is going into the most stuck stories you have and putting pen to paper uh, and writing them out conversationally even though that pen feels like it weighs 1500 pounds if you change some seemingly minor everyday ordinary language you're going to improve your breathing. And if you improve your breathing, you're going to improve every aspect of your life. And uh, don't believe me? Go your breath. You're all tense and tight. You're just all self-conscious and a poor listener. Go, go give a presentation and hold your breath. See how that goes. Go, get on a sales call hold your breath, go work out and hold your breath. I mean, do we, do we just keep on going? Our man, Alan Watts he said, when you learn to think about your thinking, you become alive in a new way. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. Learning to, um, cause most people, they, they don't have thoughts. Their thoughts have them. Okay. You got to get this stuff written down, folks. It's, 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 it is foundational to, um, well, it's the same thing as school. You know, most people don't even have a draft to hand it. They haven't have written anything down. Get it on paper and start drafting it. Watch what happens. You'll like how it feels. And part of the reason you'll like how it feels is it's going to unlock your breath. And from there, you know, you'll, um, and that's the found, that's the seat of um, a better life for you. Better better words and be here here it is as simple and as impossibly complex at the same time. The problem is words and breathing. Okay, and the solution is words and breathing. It's just different words and different breath. Okay, conflict language, projections, negations, soft talk, <laughs> breath up here, and it's just feedback. Different words, taking out soft talk. No, I am going to do that. 
I'm not kind of going to go do, go do that. And, um, you know, I, I can't keep living like this. Well, that's going to get, well, if I can't, well, I, I'm going to start living this way. I can, I can live this way. You never, uh, well, I sometimes, <sighs> You're going to get yourself out of these self-imposed stress states, folks. No one's going to do that for you. Or, or what they're going to do is they're going to um, manage your symptoms. Mm. We got a pill for that. No one's going to fix your breath for you. Okay. But they will give you a pill for the stress. Right. Think about it. Yeah. I love the uh, the term that you use, like linchpin. You have linchpin sentences. You have some linchpin words. It seems like the ultimate linchpin is breath. As soon as you just get that out of you, get that whatever that stuck energy is, and that's the key of, of to that is your words. All of a sudden, boom! You open up. You're holding yourself different. You have your physiology. You know, you're physically you've changed. Uh, you're coming across more confident. You're feeling more confident. It's yeah. It's it's amazing. Just the the energy, even when you're kind of a b in them from side to side doing that it's like wow it's 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 uh it's such a, a powerful thing and um yeah it's a big part of what we what we do uh as well we do some breath work and i know there's a, an amazing uh breath work session monthly on enlifted that i i'm going to uh which is free to the public so i'm going to definitely have some of my folks come on for that with brandon powell it's amazing that's been a huge game changer mark for me the last year um if i could you know I would even put breath over words. Like the change of words is ongoing, sure. but the breath sure. dude has been in as literally changed my life by leaps and bounds. Yes. We're known as the language people, folks. We might as well be known as the language and the breathing people and gun to head. It's about the breath. Mm. Yeah, fine. I'm here to teach you about your words and what I, I'm here to help you unlock your breathing because I know what happens when that happens. Yeah. All the stuff you want. It's the, it's the, it's, it's the through line. Yeah. It's the through line. Yeah. You know, one, th one subject that we haven't touched on yet that is my, one of my personal favorites. I really enjoy doing it with myself. Uh, you know, and it's, it, I also like projections, don't get me wrong, but um, in, in fact, I'm leading in with the negation, negations and affirmations. So negations is a fascinating thing to me. I use that a lot. I would have, you know, I, I, my inner dialogue would be have a lot to do with what I can't do. You can't do that. Are you? And then there would be like a lot of it's pressure language, right? I would, uh, in order for me to be, to have this doer, this achiever energy, I used a lot of negations. Like you can't, you can't be going to bed so early. You still got lots to do. You can't be, you know, listing all these different things that I can and can't do specifically can't do, you know? Um, and, and then the shoulds, like you really should be doing that. I've audited myself so many times and I've been using that for so long. And now I'm realizing I have this like new inner boss that I have this new inner dialogue, a relationship with my, with myself that way. And I, I always catch myself. So I'll, I'll be like, you know, if, if it's uh, I can't do that. Okay. Well, what can I do? Right. Mm. And so, which is just a, that's the easiest way. Okay. So if you're going to focus on the negation, okay, that's the negation. So what that's telling you, you can't do immediately the easiest way is to flip it and go okay well what can you do then and then focus on that and the the um the example i always use the most famous or infamous example is like the don't think of the pink elephant so what do you think of think of the pink elephant right so uh, yeah I, i'm uh, i'm a big fan of the work that we've done with negations flipping them to affirmations it's a big part of the four step story work the calls and really ironing out some of the uh some of the the garbanzo, if you will, on like the language. So yeah, what's what is your take on like negations, affirmations? What is a uh, your experience with them? Vision boards. So I was on the hippie festival circuit scene for a number of years, man. We'll, we'll say a, a, a solid three to be exact. And you know, of course, speak to your audience. And I would say. Uh, Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a vision board. Mm. Everybody raise their hand because they're hippies. And um, and then and and so for everyone who just to bring everybody onto the same page, a vision board is where you take a traditionally it's a piece of poster board and then you take pictures of the things that you want to experience, your place you want to go, stuff you want to go, the car you want to drive, all of it. 
and put it up there so you can look at it. There's something to it, majorly. And, and then I'd say, um, I like asking stupid questions. And then I'd, I'd ask, I'd ask all the hippies. I'd say, hippies, you ever, you ever, you ever put pictures of what you don't want on your vision board? And they'd go, no, why would I ever do that? And then I go, what about your internal vision board? Hmm. Crickets. Gotcha. Cause that's what negations do. They force you to stare at the stuff that negation you don't want to have happen again. I won't make that mistake again. There's a picture of me making that mistake again. Okay. Um, I can't spend all my money this month. There's a picture of me spending all my money. I'm not going to let her talk to me like that. Kablammy, double kablammy. Cause that's a negation and a projection. Okay, there, I'm forcing myself to look at her, make the thing in my imagination of her talking to me like that again. And here's a great example. Uh, uh, I was up in Calgary, Calgary, 2000 and also 14, up there doing a training for a sales team. And I stayed after and did one on one coaching sessions with everybody. And I'm in a room with a young man, two chairs, we're facing each other, listening. And he goes, Mark, I can't keep focusing on my past. Very emotional. His, his body was jerking around and, and I handed him a pen. I said, write that sentence down. And he goes, which one? And I said, the, the one you just made. I can't keep focusing on my path, past. You, you want to get immediate clarity, folks, or damn near immediate clarity, write down your words, okay? And stare at your words as opposed to believing them because it's got to be true because it's my own voice, my own head, yay. And uh, I said, read that again. I can't keep focusing on my past. And you could still hear the uh, emotion in his voice remember the higher the emotion the 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 higher the attachment there it's the same thing and i said if that's what you can't keep doing what can you start doing oh and by the way i asked him what he was feeling he's he was he's was angry uh, uh anxious and a little bit scared um oh by the way what kind of pictures are you making uh, what do you mean? Yeah. What, what do you see in your imagination when you say, I can't keep focusing on my past? You had to stop and think about it. Again, self-reflection will take you further than prayer. Thanks again, Bhagavad Gita. Um, I see myself on the couch and all alone. Where was he breathing? <laughs> and his body was all tense and rigid. And, this other thing. and I said, if that's what you can't keep doing, Remember the words, I can't keep focusing on my past. If that's what you can't keep doing, what can you start doing? And he answered in half, half of a sentence with up talk at the end because it was so new for him. New word, do something different, get something different. This is going to be clunky, okay? This, this is going to be awkward at times using different words. You think I'm kidding, I'm not kidding. Uh, focus on my future more? And it goes up at the end. And I said, yes. Now make it a full sentence. And because he's in a stress response, focus on my future more. I can, I can focus. I can focus. I can. And he's talking himself into it. Talking himself down. Talking himself forward. I can focus on my future more. And now that we had that guy pointed in the, a better direction, I said, great. What, what does that entail? Because he was struggling with sales. He was a sales guy. And because he was looking, my that's a, the first thing my driving teacher said when I got in the car. I, like I said, I'm turning 46 when I was 15 and a half years old. So 30 years ago, I'm still talking about it. Look where you want to go because you're probably going to go there. And so now he's looking where he wants to go. He said, uh, what, what, what's three things you can do? Uh, well, you know, um, there's a couple of books that everybody keeps telling me I should read. Okay. We write it down. Um, they have, um, you know, the, the social, the social networks, the, the so social time every month, everybody goes out and, you know, I can go to those and they have a mentorship program at work. 
That dude wrote me eight months later and said, you know what? I did those things. I read those books. I go hang out with this, with, with, with the, the, the sales team after hours. And um, I enrolled in the mentor program and my whole professional career changed and I moved out and I've got my own place. That's an example of a negation, folks. The keywords, can'ts, won'ts, isn'ts, nots, hasn'ts, haven'ts, shouldn'ts. It, they all force you to stare at the thing you don't want anymore. Um, but I don't want that anymore. Who cares? Stare at it again because you're worth it's it, two plus two equals four for Mark England and Einstein. Okay. So change the math, change the words. Take out the two, put in three. You're going to get something different. Man, so good. So good. One of the last uh, negations that I wanted to to bring up because it is uh, quite fun and um, it's one that I'm, I'm uh, attempting to catch myself on as much as I can is the difference between the but, right? But and and. So but is like the most, what is it? It's like, I forget what we <laughs> refer to it as in and left it, but it's like the most like insidious or like sly or it's just, uh, you know, it's for asshole me, language. It's, it's asshole language. Let's face it. Let's call it what it is. So, but versus and. So, switching up a but for an and. Matt, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but that's a that's a double whammy because you got the don't and then. Um, uh, I really respect your opinion, but okay. Um, I like. <laughs> I like what you're wearing, but versus uh, Matt, I respect your opinion and, or um, I really like what you, you cooked last night and, or you look great and. So when we use but, but creates tension and tightness and brace for impact the person is bracing for impact whatever you said before is irrelevant whatever comes before the butt is demoted whatever comes after the butt is promoted mm. okay and um that's what they're going to hear that's what they're going to remember um and many a fun a potentially fun evening has been wrecked with um and you feel like an asshole saying it and it usually creates some stress, chaos, potentially even a fight. You know, I like, um, <laughs> you're important to me, but like, just hold, hold still. And I'm going to backhand you by accident, even though if I was about to say the nicest thing, it's like, I just, I, I have now, like we say down here in the South, it goes over like a turd in the punch bowl. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's good. And we have to have this. So the story, just in case people have connected the dots as to why it's asshole language, is like okay, so I'm sure I'm I'm sure they've connected the dots by now. The butt is is it's it's a unique it's 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 an old category asshole language. Yeah, it's, it's, there's only one word in there. That's right. It's butt. Yeah, it's butt. Yeah, and you know what? Even like I'm watching you say it, and and it's 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 obviously we're having some fun with it, but it's it's so incredibly true. When you say the butt, and I like when you say it's the demotion uh, promotion thing, and feels like I feel like there's a collaborative energy. When you say and, it's like an invitation to right. you know to to join still. Where there's a butt, it's like boom. There's like a wall that gets put up, right? Yeah, it's just it's energetic wall. So you, it's a uh, you, you, know. you nailed it. Whatever and equals the beginning and the end. Ooh, yeah. It puts us on common ground. Whatever yeah. is said before it is as 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 is as valuable as what comes after it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Isn't that amazing that a three-letter word can be swapped out for another three-letter word and the the game changes? Incredible. I you know what? It 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 is unbelievable. And it's also fascinating. I find this work fascinating, and I'm so grateful for this work. Uh, I fell in love on site, say 18 years ago. And I'm, like I said, I studied for three years and I went pro in 2007, so 15. And uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to have found something that holds my attention effortlessly. And it's crazy in the sense that I can change, like you said, a three letter word and have a profoundly different experience in here and then also over there. It's wild. It is wild. Mark, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Negation acknowledged. See, if I, I catch myself. Uh, we, we went through some amazing Game. stuff. We're, it's all about words, stories, breathing. Thank you so much for coming on. You know, the, the, the stories that you have in there, for me, uh, stories are a great way of, of having information stick. Right. Mm -hmm. So somebody can say like, okay, these are the facts and the definitions all that. But as soon as you got a, a, it's that, that's like the adhesive for me is for me for learning is having those, those stories. Cause then as soon as you're like, yeah, you know, I had to borrow my dad's truck. I, you know, I had my, my, my vehicle was stolen. It's just like, yeah, it just, it, it brings these visuals and all that. So I really appreciate the stories that you brought to it. And, you know, like it's, it's it, it was good to just jam on this stuff, man. It's like, this stuff is so important and, you know, like words, stories breathing what would what, what be like your final words uh you know for us tonight mark abracadabra i mean this is this is this is an ancient technology technology as in technical knowledge okay technique technique of using our language okay so abracadabra turns out uh, i personally think matt that it's the most well recognized word on the planet you can go almost anywhere. I mean, I, I before the I, my passport used to used to look like a bomb went off in there with all the pages and the stamps and the stuff. And you go anywhere and say abracadabra, you know, English speaking, not English speaking, and, and everybody goes to magic. Okay, what does abracadabra mean? I found out in 2012 in Ecuador when I was out to lunch with some friends. And a guy knew I was in the language space, and he said, uh, hey, Mark, very nonchalant, you know what uh, abracadabra means? And uh, yeah, 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 magic. Uh, no, it, uh, it's actually Aramaic, which is an ancient language, folks. It's the language the original Old Testament was written in. And he goes, oh, it's actually Aramaic, and it translates to with my word I create or with my word I influence. The hair stood up on my arm and the back of my neck, and I put my fork down, and I went over, and I asked him, I, I, I said, tell me everything. And the teachers of the day, the, the metaphysicians of the day, if you want to get all woo about it, they would triangulate it and wear it around their neck to remind them of the power and the mechanism of the spoken word and to make things not woo and very practical. They knew that if they were trash talking themselves in their head, whatever they wanted to do with their life was going to be exponentially harder than it had to be. Right? And they also knew that if they got their language working for them, then whatever they wanted to do in their life, with their life, with their finite amount of time here became way more likely to happen and uh i've been talking about that since man people love it it's a great way to um start the conversation about the power language with the kids hey kids you know what abracadabra means yeah magic no it's even better than that yeah and in a sense, it is, it is magic, right? Like a lot yeah. of this is, you know, swapping out a word for another word and just completely transforming your own energy and the energy of people around you. Yeah. That's, to cool. me, that's magic, man. That's, 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 that's pretty damn cool. It's, I agree. I yeah. agree. So Mark, thank you so much for coming on. Ladies and gentlemen, head coach of Enlifted Mark England.